Hi, Rachel here with the Charlotte Mason Plenary. We're so glad you found the audiobook of Volume 6, Charlotte's Last Volume, A Philosophy of Education. It is by far, in my opinion, the best and most transformative volume, so you're definitely in the right place. Now, we at a Charlotte Mason Plenary are offering this audio to you perfectly free because we think everybody should be reading Charlotte's words. However, we do offer an annotated edition in both print and in the audiobook version. So, the best of both worlds, in my opinion, is the audiobook, whether it has annotations or not, and the annotated editions. Because in the annotated editions, you get all of these wonderful side notes in the margins that explain what Charlotte's talking about, as well as give you definitions and stuff to all that uh, Victorian English. So, best of both worlds, audiobook and annotated edition. Please visit us over at a Charlotte Mason Plenary at cmplenary.com, and I hope you enjoy the audiobook. Chapter 1, Self-Education the title of this chapter may awaken some undeserved sympathy, gratifying visions of rhythmic movements, independent action, self-expression in various interesting ways occur to the mind. For surely these things constitute self-education. Most of these modern panacea are desirable and by no means to be neglected. Limbs trained to grace and agility, a hand to dexterity and precision, an eye made to see and an ear to hear a voice taught to interpret. We know today that all these possibilities of joy in living should be open to every child, and we look forward, even too hopefully, to the manner of citizen who shall be the outcome of our educational zeal. Now, although we of the Parents' Union have initiated some of these educational outworks and have gladly and gratefully adopted others, yet is our point of view different we are profoundly skeptical as to the effect of all or any of these activities upon character and conduct. A person is not built up from without, but from within. That is, he is living, and all external educational appliances and activities which are intended to mold his character are decorative and not vital. This sounds like a stale truism, but let us consider a few corollaries of the notion that a child is a person, and that a person is primarily living. Now no external application is capable of nourishing life or promoting growth. Baths of wine, wrappings of velvet, have no effect upon physical life except as they may hinder it. Life is sustained on that which is taken in by the organism, not by that which is applied from without. Perhaps the only allowable analogy with the human mind is the animal body, especially the human body, for it is that which we know most about. The well-worn plant and garden analogy is misleading, especially as regards that tiresome busybody, the gardener, who will direct the inclination of every twig, the position of every leaf, but even then apart from the gardener, the child garden is an intolerable idea as failing to recognize the essential property of a child, his personality, a property all but absent in a plant. Now, let us consider for a moment the parallel behavior of body and mind. The body lives by air, grows on food, demands rest, flourishes on a diet wisely various. So, of the mind, by which I mean the entire spiritual nature, all that which is not body, it breathes in air, calls for both activity and rest, and flourishes on a wisely varied dietary. We go round the house and round the house, but rarely go into the house of mind. We offer mental gymnastics, but these do not take the place of food, and of that we serve the most meager rations no more than that bean a day. Diet for the body is abundantly considered, but no one pauses to say, I wonder, does the mind need food too, and regular meals, and what is its proper diet? I have asked myself this question, and have labored for fifty years to find the answer, and am anxious to impart what I think I know, 
but the answer cannot be given in the form of do this and that, but rather as an invitation to consider this and that. Action follows when we have thought duly. The life of the mind is sustained upon ideas. There is no intellectual vitality in the mind to which ideas are not presented several times, say, every day. But surely, surely, as Mrs. Proudy would say, scientific experiments, natural beauty, nature study, rhythmic movements, sensory exercises are all fertile in ideas. Quite commonly they are so, as regards ideas of invention and discovery, and even in ideas of art, but for the moment it may be well to consider the ideas that influence life, that is, character and conduct. These, it would seem, pass directly from mind to mind, and are neither helped nor hindered by educational outworks. Every child gets many of these ideas by word of mouth, by way of family traditions, proverbial philosophy. In fact, by what we may call a kind of oral literature. But when we compare the mind with the body, we perceive that three square meals a day are generally necessary to health, and that a causal diet of ideas is poor and meager. Our schools turn out a good many clever young persons wanting in nothing but initiative, the power of reflection, and the sort of moral imagination which enables you to put yourself in his place. These qualities flourish upon a proper diet, and this is not afforded by the ordinary school book, or in sufficient quantity by the ordinary lesson. I should like to emphasize quantity, which is as important for the mind as for the body. Both require their square meals. It is no easy matter to give its proper sustenance to the mind. Hard things are said of children, that they have no brains, a low order of intellect, and so on, but many of us are able to vouch for the fine intelligence shown by children who are fed with the proper mind stuff. But teachers do not usually take the trouble to find out what this is. We come dangerously near to what Plato condemns as that lie of the soul, that corruption of the highest truth, of which Protagoras is guilty in the saying that knowledge is sensation. What else are we saying when we run after educational methods which are purely sensory? Knowledge is not sensation, nor is it to be derived through sensation. We feed upon the thoughts of other minds, and thought applied to thought generates thought, and we become more thoughtful. No one need invite us to reason, compare, imagine. The mind, like the body, digests its proper food, and it must have the labor of digestion, or it ceases to function. But the children ask for bread, and we give them a stone. We give information about objects and events which mind does not attempt to digest but casts out bodily, upon an examination paper, perhaps. But let information hang upon a principle, be inspired by an idea, and it is taken with avidity and used in making whatsoever in the spiritual nature stands for tissue in the physical. Education, said Lord Haldane some time ago, is a matter of the spirit. No wiser word has been said on the subject, and yet we persist in applying education from without as a bodily activity or emollient. We begin to see light. No one knoweth the things of a man but the spirit of a man which is in him. Therefore, there is no education but self-education, and as soon as a young child begins his education, he does so as a student. Our business is to give him mind stuff, and both quality and quantity are essential. Naturally, each of us possesses this mind stuff only in limited measure, but we know where to procure it, for the best thought the world possesses is stored in books. We must open books to children, the best books. Our own concern is abundant provision and orderly serving. I am jealous for the children. Every modern educational movement tends to belittle them intellectually, and none more so than a late ingenious attempt to feed normal children with the pap meat which may be good for the mentally sick. But to all wildly popular things comes suddenly and inexorably death without hope of resurrection. If Mr. Bernard Shaw is right, I need not discuss a certain popular form of new education. 
it has been ably said that education should profit by the divorce which is now in progress from psychology on the one hand and sociology on the other. But what if education should use her recovered liberty to make a monstrous alliance with pathology? Various considerations urge upon me a rather distasteful task. It is time I showed my hand and gave some account of work, the principles and practices of which should, I think, be of general use. Like those lepers who feasted at the gates of a famished city, I begin to take shame to myself. I have attempted to unfold in various volumes a system of educational theory which seems to me able to meet any rational demand, even that severest criterion set up by Plato. It is able to run the gauntlet of objections and is ready to disprove them, not by appeals to opinion, but to absolute truth. Some of it is new, much of it is old. Like the quality of mercy, it is not strained. Certainly it is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes, and a sort of radiancy of look distinguishes both scholar and teacher engaged in this manner of education. But there are no startling results to challenge attention. Professor Bompa Smith remarked in an inaugural address at the University of Manchester that, if we can guide our practice by the light of a comprehensive theory, we shall widen our experience by attempting tasks which would not otherwise have occurred to us. It is possible to offer the light of such a comprehensive theory, and the result is precisely what the professor indicates. A large number of teachers attempt tasks which would not otherwise have occurred to them. One discovers a thing because it is there, and no sane person takes credit to himself for such discovery. On the contrary, he recognizes with King Arthur these jewels whereupon I chance divinely are for public use. For many years we have had access to a sort of Aladdin's cave which I long to throw open for public use. Let me try to indicate some of the advantages of the theory I am urging. It fits all ages, even the seven ages of man. It satisfies brilliant children and discovers intelligence in the dull. It secures attention, interest, concentration, without effort on the part of teacher or taught. Children, I think all children, so taught, express themselves in forcible and fluent English and use a copious vocabulary. An unusual degree of nervous stability is attained. Also, intellectual occupation seems to make for chastity in thought and life. Parents become interested in the schoolroom work and find their children delightful companions. Children show delight in books other than storybooks and manifest a genuine love of knowledge. Teachers are relieved from much of the labor of corrections. Children taught according to this method do exceptionally well at any school. It is unnecessary to stimulate these young scholars by marks, prizes, etc., after all, it is not a quack medicine I am writing about, though the reader might think so, and there is no bottle in question. Over 30 years ago, I published a volume about the home education of children, and people wrote asking how these counsels of perfection could be carried out with the aid of the private governess as she then existed. It occurred to me that a series of curricula might be devised embodying sound principles and securing that children should be in a position of less dependence on their teacher than they then were. In other words, that their education should be largely self-education. A sort of correspondence school was set up, the motto of which, I am, I can, I ought, I will, has had much effect in throwing children upon the possibilities, capabilities, duties, and determining power belonging to them as persons. Children are born persons is the first article of the educational credo in question. The response made by children ranging in age from 6 to 18 astonished me. Though they only showed the power of attention, the avidity for knowledge, the clearness of thought, the nice discrimination in books, and the ability to deal with many subjects for which I have given them credit in advance. I need not repeat what I have urged elsewhere on the subject of knowledge, and will only add that anyone may apply a test. 
Let him read to a child of any age from six to ten an account of an incident, graphically and tersely told, and the child will relate what he has heard point by point, though not word for word, and will add delightful original touches. What is more, he will relate the passage months later because he has visualized the scene and appropriated that bit of knowledge. A rhetorical passage written in journalese makes no impression upon him. If a passage be read more than once, he may become letter perfect, but the spirit, the individuality, has gone out of the exercise. An older boy or girl will read one of Bacon's essays, say, or a passage from De Quincey, and will write or tell it forcibly and with some style, either at the moment or months later. We know how Fox recited a whole pamphlet of Burke's at a college supper, though he had probably read it no more than once. Here, on the very surface, is the key to that attention, interest, literary style, wide vocabulary, love of books, and readiness in speaking, which we all feel should belong to an education that is only begun at school and continued throughout life. These are the things that we all desire, and how to obtain them is some part of the open secret I am laboring to disclose for public use. I am anxious to bring a quite successful educational experiment before the public at a moment when we are told on authority that education must be an appeal to the spirit if it is to be made interesting. Here is education which is as interesting and fascinating as a fine art to parents, children, and teachers. During the last 30 years, thousands of children educated on these lines have grown up in love with knowledge and manifesting a right judgment in all things, so far as a pretty wide curriculum gives them data. I would have children taught to read before they learn the mechanical arts of reading and writing, and they learn delightfully. They give perfect attention to paragraph or page read to them and are able to relate the matter point by point in their own words. But they demand classical English and cannot learn to read in this sense upon anything less. They begin their schooling in letters at six and begin at the same time to learn mechanical reading and writing. A child does not lose by spending a couple of years in acquiring these because he is, meanwhile, reading the Bible, history, geography, tales, with close attention and a remarkable power of reproduction, or rather, of translation into his own language. He is acquiring a copious vocabulary and the habit of consecutive speech. In a word, he is an educated child from the first, and his power of dealing with books with several books in the course of a morning school increases with his age. But children are not all alike. There is as much difference between them as between men or women. Two or three months ago, a small boy, not quite six, came to school by post. And his record was that he could read anything in five languages and was now teaching himself the Greek characters, could find his way about the continental Bradshaw, and was a chubby, vigorous little person. All this the boy brings with him when he comes to school. He is exceptional, of course, just as a man with such accomplishments is exceptional. But I believe that all children bring with them much capacity which is not recognized by their teachers, chiefly intellectual capacity, always in advance of motor power, which we are apt to drown in deluges of explanation or dissipate in futile labors in which there is no advance. People are naturally divided into those who read and think and those who do not read or think, and the business of schools is to see that all their scholars shall belong to the former class. It is worthwhile to remember that thinking is inseparable from reading, which is concerned with the content of a passage and not merely with the printed matter. The children I am speaking of are much occupied with things as well as with books, because education is the science of relations, is the principle which regulates their curriculum. That is, a child goes to school with many aptitudes which he should put into effect. So he learns a good deal of science, because children have no difficulty in understanding principles, though technical details baffle them. 
He practices various handicrafts that he may know the feel of wood, clay, leather, and the joy of handling tools, that is, that he may establish a due relation with materials. But always it is the book, the knowledge, the clay, the bird or blossom he thinks of, not his own place or his own progress. I am afraid that some knowledge of the theory we advance is necessary to the open-minded teacher who would give our practices a trial, because every detail of schoolroom work is the outcome of certain principles. For instance, it would be quite easy without much thought to experiment with our use of books, but in education as in religion, it is the motive that counts, and the boy who reads his lesson for a good mark becomes word perfect, but he does not know. But these principles are obvious and simple enough. And when we consider that at present education is chaotic for want of a unifying theory, and that there happens to be no other comprehensive theory in the field which is in line with modern thought and fits every occasion, might it not well be to try one which is immediately practicable and always pleasant and has proved itself by producing many capable, serviceable, dutiful men and women of sound judgment and willing mind. In urging a method of self-education for children in lieu of the vicarious education which prevails, I should like to dwell on the enormous relief to teachers, a self-sacrificing and greatly overburdened class. The difference is just that between driving a horse that is light and a horse that is heavy in hand. The former covers the ground of his own gay will and the driver goes merrily. The teacher who allows his scholars the freedom of the city of books is at liberty to be their guide, philosopher, and friend. It is no longer the mere instrument of forcible intellectual feeding. I hope you enjoyed this chapter of Charlotte Mason's Volume 6. And of course, if you need help, there's always the annotated edition, or you can come find us and ask questions. We'd love to help you. You can find us at cmplenary.com or over in our Facebook group. Look forward to chatting with you.